Good evening and welcome to this, the third Peccadillo Sofa Club uh, live stream Q&A. Uh, my name's Alex Davidson and I'm one of the cinema curators at the Barbican Centre in London and I'm really, really delighted to be welcome uh, to be joined today uh, by the director of And Then We Danced, uh, Levin Akin. Uh, hi. Uh, this will be a live Q&A. If you have any questions uh, that you'd like to ask Levin uh, during this interview, then you can contact us via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or the uh, live chat using the hashtags uh, Peccadillo Club, uh, hashtag Peccadillo Sofa Club, or hashtag And Then We Danced Q&A. And we'll try and get through as many questions as we can during uh, the interview. Uh, but uh, for now, I'll kick things off. Uh, so, uh, hi, Levin. How are you doing? Hi, Alex. I'm good. How are you? Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought a nice way to start might be just by way of introduction, if you could say a few words about yourself and how uh, your career in filmmaking started, because oh. I know that uh, And Then We Danced is, is not your first feature. Uh, okay, um, well, I started off um, when I was 22 uh, as an intern for Roy Anderson, which is a Swedish director who did uh, songs from the second floor and other good films. Uh, so I started working there. Uh, I worked there for a year or two. And then I started working at Swedish TV, uh, doing different assistant jobs. Uh, and then I started directing for TV, and I did that uh up until 2011 and then since then i've made films uh this is my third film and uh, i um uh, i'm gonna be doing tv now again actually in the fall but yeah that's a short summary a lot of other things happened in between but you know and short. and uh before we get into And Then We Danced Itself and the production of the film and the reaction to the film and the content of the film, I, I wanted to ask uh, just about the genesis of the film, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, I read that in, in 2013, I think it was, there was a, a gay pride uh, march in Tbilisi, mm -hmm. which uh, and both the, the march and the reaction to that march in some ways inspired some of the creative process that led to uh, the making of And Then We Danced. C could you talk a little bit about what happened at that march? Um, yeah, so that was the first Pride Parade that um, was to be held in, in Tbilisi, in Georgia. Um, so 50 people, I think it was, decided to have this Pride Parade. And they were met by a counter demonstration of, I think there were like 20,000 people, probably. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it got pretty violent. Fortunately, nobody was, you know, nobody died or anything, but people were injured. And um, I saw this uh, on the news in Sweden, and I have Georgian heritage, and I was sort of appalled by, by what I saw. So I decided to go there and do research on this topic and just to get a sense of the situation in Georgia for LGBTQ people. Uh, and, and I met, you know, many interesting people along the way, interesting stories, and one thing led to another, and um, it led me to And Then We Danced, what became And Then We Danced. Mm. And it's interesting to hear, because I think, I mean, I, Cars on Table, I've, I've seen this film uh, several times now, I think it's a, a really, really beautiful piece of work, and... I saw it at the UK premiere yeah. at the London Film Festival and it had such a fantastic reaction there. And I've seen it a few times now and I think one of the things I really love about it is it really subverts expectation all the way through. And I think all the way through, at least the first time I was I was watching the film, I kept on waiting for something unpleasant to happen. I think yeah. the scene where they, they stumble drunkenly out of the, the nightclub in Tbilisi and pass the guys on the street and they're quite vulnerable. I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a scene where they're, they're beaten up or yeah. later when there's the, the confession, not confession, but when there's the, the very quiet, sensitive dialogue between Merab and his brother at the end, the reaction isn't necessarily what you would predict. Was it important for you to to show? I mean, though it's not necessarily the most optimistic film all the way through in terms of queer represent of, of queer rights in the country. Was it important for you to show these moments of of joy or of, of subtlety in, in of queer experience? Yeah, yes, it was. I wanted the film to feel hopeful, um, and you know, like sort of like a warm embrace uh, rather than you know a punch in the stomach. Mm. Uh, 
And it was important for me that, you know, Merab's character never was punished or never, um, you know, he never, he never questions his sexuality, even in the film. He's, you know, even though he lives in this society where, where you know, it's obvious that it's not acceptable, he sort of, you know, embraces love. And in mm -hmm. the end, it's hurt by love. But but he he never questions himself, and and that was also important to me. Um, yeah, yeah, and and with the brother, I wanted to show you know that there can be support um, in places where you least expect them. Mm. I mean, moving on on the subject of the brother, I think the portrayal of masculinity is is very clearly a very important theme of the film, and how masculinity is performed or how it is represented in culture uh, and I found that a really interesting uh, topic as well. I mean, that, is it fair to say Georgia has uh, very traditional views around masculinity because that's what certainly what comes across in the film? If, if uh, sorry, you were breaking up there for a while. If I, if I uh, think they have traditional views around masculinity, do, do you think Georgian? Do you think Georgia has those traditional views, and was it important for you to uh, show different aspects of masculinity within the film? It was. It was, and and you know, I also never wanted to come into the film saying like, look, these are the old traditional values. They're bad, and we have to, you know, destroy them. It's about embracing tradition and embracing um, heritage but also being able to push that heritage in a new direction um, to make it more inclusive. Um, yeah, those thoughts, you know, were with me while making the film. Mm. Um, wonderful, thank you. Uh, we've had a few uh, audience questions already coming in. So our first one is from Belinda, who says, uh, the film is wonderfully rich aesthetically. How did you come to work with uh, Lisabi Friedel? And can you mm. talk more about that collaboration? And then she says thank you at the end of the year. Very episode. good question. Um, so actually, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd never met Lisabi before I made this film. Uh, and it was uh, my producer who thought that we would uh, work well together. So we, the first time we met was through Skype. And um, we hit it off right away. I thought she had interesting ideas and she had done some really beautiful work before. Um, and, and it, it, it was a very nice collaboration. We, we, um, we, uh, she did not actually come to Georgia because I did a lot of research on my own first. Uh, and then Lisa B came in toward the end and I think she was there, you know, the four or five weeks before we started shooting the film. And, and, you know, it's just, we, we really decided that we wanted to use, locations that existed, colors that existed. You know, we filmed a lot in, you know, we didn't change anything. We would just walk into a place and shoot. And we had to be very flexible. And Liz Sabi has a great, great hand with the camera. She's the one holding the camera 90% of the film. When it's not on steady, she's the one behind, behind the lens. And, you know, she's not that big and she had this big camera, but she's strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, um, I think, you know, Liz Sabi really is a, a big part of, of, I mean, obviously she is, but, but she really is a big part of, the, um, of, the, of this film, of the spirit of this film. Um, Luis has asked, uh, con congrats on your unforgettably great film. Thank you. Uh, you show the complicated relationship between folk culture, traditional dance, and uh, gender mm -hmm. roles and di sexual diversity in the film. Uh, could you talk about your motivation to do so? I wanted to, you know, I wanted to tell a story about somebody who doesn't fit the norm and somebody who wants to sort of break, break, break free of, of the traditional norm. And I used traditional dance because I thought it was a very um, a good way to show a foreign audience who's not familiar with Georgian culture what Georgian culture is about and what uh, the patriarchal norms of, of Georgian society is. So that's why I used dance um, as a story element in the film. And also, you know, it's cinematically very interesting with dance. Uh, and then, um, and, and, from, and, and from that, I sort of um, built the narrative around uh, 
a lot of this character, Merab, um, coming to terms with his, you know, with his uh, place in this society and how he, how he, in the end, breaks free from it, does his own thing or, or does his own sort of interpretation of it. Um, Jose asks, uh, since Georgia isn't very supportive of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, were the gay clubs that we see in the movie actual gay clubs that, uh, or were they bars slash clubs that were reappropriated as gay clubs for the movie? No, they're actual, actually gay clubs. The first bar is a place that exists. It's called Success. And it actually opened while I was doing research in Tbilisi. So I was there like the opening night of that place. Uh, I think it opened in like 2017 or something like that. Uh, but it's been through quite rough times. I mean, it's, but it's there. But they, you know, they have security and, and things. But it's there. And I think now people don't really care about it, actually. So, you know, slowly... Uh, things change and 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 the big techno club Bassiani uh, that one um, it's a it's a techno club it's very open you know but they have gay nights or or queer nights uh, every Saturday I think or something like that so it's not you know it's just for everyone basically mm. uh, so Savannah asks what was the process to get permission to use the older folk videos in the film? Did mm. ensembles give permission to use their videos as they had no physical part in the film? Actually, no, they did not. I mean, we didn't even go through them. Those clips were from, I think, the National Georgian TV archive. So they had the rights to the clips. So we mm. never had to go through the ensembles. How did, they, how did you find the videos, because the, all the films, were they, are they all in an archive? Are they freely accessible to the public? It was, uh, mm, um, I think they are in Georgia. It was our Georgian producer who found them. Um, and we, we looked through Reuters, I think, and Patea here in Europe, but they were super expensive uh, to, to get the, you know, to be able to buy those clips. So we went through Georgia and it was our, our, our Georgian producer, Keti Danilia, who got those clips for us mm. uh, Adam asks or, or says uh, thank you for such a thoughtful heartwarming film uh, could you elaborate a bit more about the importance of Georgian dance in the current culture and is it or was it still prominent among uh, youth in Georgia well so Georgian dance is is it actually has a very big part of Georgian culture today and uh, uh, most kids, like I, I would say, like ninety percent of kids uh, dance Georgian dance after school as an after school activity, uh, and then you know a few of them move on to sort of join these professional ensembles. It's 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 it is sort of prestigious, especially if you're in the main national ensemble. Um, so it it plays an important role in, in Georgian society for sure. Uh, although the the dances that you see today is already a, a, a interpretation of the folk dance because in the 50s, which they mentioned in the film, they changed, uh, uh, um, th they collected these folk dances from different uh, parts of Georgia and the Caucasus, and then they did sort of this show this piece from it. Uh, and that's, you know, the dance that you see in the film. Mm -hmm. Uh, Subankar so asks, uh, I wanted to know about the casting. How did you zone in on these two leads as they seemed so perfect for their respective parts? I think I actually sort of rewrote it. I mean, I, I, I didn't exactly know what type of leads I was looking for while I was looking. So I was more looking for people I found were interesting somehow. And then once I'd found them, I rewrote or, you know, created the characters. So I thought both Levan and Bachi, uh, the, who play the main leads, were intriguing. Um, so they sort of, you know, I rewrote stuff after I'd met them. And yeah, I thought, I thought they were interesting and they had good chemistry. Did you find Levan on, uh, on Instagram? Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And did he has has he gone on to act in other stuff since this film? Um, he will. Mm -hmm. uh, he he has some other films he's going to be in. So um, um, I don't think it's official yet, though. But um, I know that later this year, I think it was he was going to start doing something. Mm -hmm. So and, and Bachi and Bachi is also um, 
doing on his way on, on doing interesting projects. So yeah, I think they're both hopefully uh, going to do more interesting films. Uh, we've had a question in uh, saying, what are your favorite European LGBT films and are there any other LGBT uh, Georgian films, to your knowledge? Uh, um, European George, um, LGBTQ films. Um, what are my favorite? Um, I saw End of the Century the other day. Mm. I like that. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Um, we talked about that earlier today. Mm -hmm. I, that was a fantastic, fantastic film. Um, yeah, and uh, Georgian, uh, to my knowledge, there's no like explicitly queer Georgian film. There's a new film that came out this year or late last year, um, which is a female um, love story. I haven't seen it. Um, and I can't now remember the name of it. And then I know there was some sort of like very subtle uh, gay film that came out a few years ago. Um, and then and there's been some short films, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. We've had, uh, there's a question here from Elena, which asks uh, specifically about um, access to things like uh, contraceptives and health products. Um, oh, we're Georgia. breaking up. Alex, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, can you, can you hear me now? that you're breaking it. Sorry. Of yes. course. Uh, we've got a question from Elena, which is uh, about um, access to uh, contraceptives and health products for LGBTQ people, uh, minorities and women in Georgia. Um, and is it easy to have access to things like condoms and such like for, for uh, queer people? Do, I, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I mean, actually, I think it is sort of easy nowadays um, because there, there are some very good NGOs and LGBTQ organizations in so at least in the gay bar that I mentioned earlier I remember they had like condoms lying around in bowls and stuff so I think it is pretty pretty easy um, to stay safe um, I mean and with the contraceptives I mean buying them from the pharmacy I remember I was actually asking women about that when I was shooting and I got like different answers one girl was like oh no I never it's never a problem to buy it in the pharmacy I don't feel you know shamed or anything for doing it and then other people I talked to were like yeah I, I always feel like they're you know looking at me like I'm a, a cheap woman or something when I buy condoms or you know so I don't know I, I, I don't know how the situation is in detail uh, a question from uh, Trevor, uh, who says, as a former Ukrainian folk dancer who oh. just happens to be gay, this film spoke a lot to me. Do you see this film speaking to all folk dance cultures? What do you want folk dance ensembles to take away from this film? Oh, I mean, I, of course, I think it speaks to, I think it speaks to the queer experience as a whole. Uh, I mean, you know, um, and and I was never a folk dancer, but it, it you know it, it it's close to me the story and you know the story of just sort of trying to find your place in a in in a in a spot that's not um, accepting. I think that speaks to many people, and also breaking free and telling you know telling the authority that you know you're, you're gonna follow your dream and your goals but but um i think it translates into folk dance for sure i mean f all types of folk dance. i can imagine obviously since trevor it spoke to trevor so i'm happy it did that um, um yeah i don't know if i answered that question but yes i think it does <laughs> is my answer <laughs> thank you uh, a question from Andrew uh, say, asking, how does the cast feel about the reception of the film in Georgia uh, and also worldwide? And maybe you could talk a bit about what the, what's how, how some of the reception was in Georgia when it was first premiered. So the reception in Georgia when it first premiered, it, the film has been very, very supported in Georgia from many people, but it also has gotten a lot of criticism. And, you know, there were basically riots when we tried to screen the film in Georgia. Um, 
<clears throat> so it was pretty intense. We could only screen it for three days due to the heavy protests. And we needed very heavy security. I think the journey for the main actors in the film, especially Levin and Bacci, has been very double. I think on one hand, it's been very exciting and, you know, different and and, and things like that. And also, you know, it became a world film. So, you know, of course it's, it's very exciting, but I think also, you know, every coin has two sides. I think on the other hand, it's also been very hard and difficult. I think they felt, you know, some pressure probably. Um, so, I mean, I can't speak for their experience cause I'm not them, but I can imagine that it has been, it has been, you know, both good and bad. Mm. We have, um, we've actually had three, uh, a few questions now uh, specifically about the music in the film. Uh, mm-hmm. The first one is, is there a way of tracing the techno songs played in the scene with uh, Merab in the uh, nightclub? Yes, there is. Uh, or is there? Well, I know what song, that, what, it, what is it called? Who was the DJ? Hmm, I'll figure it out while we're sitting here. I'm going to get back to that. Okay, next uh, question. Uh, there are two questions uh, which are different, but both refer to the scene with the with Robin's song "Honey" playing. Uh, so uh-huh. the first one is uh, in the honey scene. Was there a significance in to Merab's hat in that scene? Was it chosen to show contrast from its associated dagger dance, which is an all male, which is all male and aggressive? Was it an aesthetic, an aesthetic choice? Why well, that he he wore that that hat. If it was an ex- uh, well, I mean that hat is a is a traditional Georgian sheep herder's hat, uh, and they use it in in a specific Georgian dance. I think it's the Tiuluri dance. So he's sort of like having fun with it um, because they usually use it in in their routines. Mm. Um, yeah. And the the he's, second he's question. Being, he's being cheeky. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the second question is, could you tell us about the genesis of the instantly iconic scene? This is from a user called Zofa Wild. The instantly iconic scene where Marab dances for Arakli and how you came to choose Honey by Robin uh, for the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. So I love Robin, obviously. Uh, and that album had just come out while we were shooting uh, the film. So we were all sort of listening to it, at least me and the DOP was. And, you know, in the script, it just said, basically, Levin, our Marab dances seductively in front of um, Irakli. And when it came to shoot that scene, we tried a few different tracks. And I mean, this was really insane because we didn't know if we could get the rights to that song. You know, we did this movie sort of on the fly in a way. So, uh, but I was thinking, like, it's if it's a Swedish artist, it's going to be easier, at least since I am from Sweden. And, you know, uh, so we tried a different a few different Robin songs and nothing really clicked uh, for Merab and then that song started playing and everything just clicked and it it actually that scene happened in the moment which is Mm. very very uh, interesting and it was very much um, Levan's or Levan who plays Merab's spirit and mood in the moment that sort of set the tone of that scene. Now the, the next uh, question is also about a dance scene involving Marab. Uh, Ariana asks, was Marab's final dance scene uh, improvised? No, it wasn't. So it, it had a choreography. Uh, it was by uh, Natya Chikvadze, who is a great uh, Georgian choreographer. Uh, she did the sort of contemporary um, moves in that scene. And then um, so they had a base for it, but then I wanted Levan to put his interpretation in it. So parts of it was him also in the moment putting in impulses that he felt while shooting that scene. Uh, um, so it was, I would say it was a mix of both. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Marco asks, uh, Mark Kermode said that every dance in the film had its own significance, like each dance pushed the narrative forward in a new direction. What does Levin say? Thanks so much for an amazing film. It was the last film I saw at the Rio Cinema before it closed. So the question was if every dance has a different meaning in the film. Yes, and each dance pushed the narrative forward in a new direction. And what's your response to that? Uh, that yeah, question, Mark I mean, it is. I mean, it, uh, Again, dance is such a wonderful way to narrate something without dialogue. And, and you know, 
for them to show emotions and show where they're at uh, emotionally. So it, it was it was part of the story. Um, mm. uh, dances in the film. Mm. One response I had to watching the final scene. This is this is my question. Uh, is uh, when I first saw it, and this may sound like it's not a too cheap a comment, but when I first saw the final scene even though tonally it's completely different. It kind of reminded me in some ways of the last scene in, in Flashdance, this uh, 1980s blockbuster. Uh, mm. And in that film, it's someone uh, proving their worth uh, as, a, as a talented yeah. dancer. Whereas in, in and then we danced. I'm not saying it's uh, was inspired by flash dance, but it's a it's a different. Uh, it's very subversive. No, scene. I mean, I haven't. I actually haven't seen flash dance, but um, I hear it's a great movie, so I take that as a compliment. But I think generally, and I've heard many people say so, uh, and I know that. Um, it was for sure my inspiration. Uh, there is a lot of 80s and 90s. The, fi the film has this sort of 80s, 90s feel to it, mm. I think. And there is a lot of John Hughes there. We talked about that earlier. And and the the film, some kind of wonderful, the sort of tri love triangle. Um, so I can see that. I think, I think in... When we've discussed the film before, you said this is the suddenly uh, Georgia teens have their own American teen movie with this one, which I really yeah. liked as a, as a way of describing yeah. the film. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with those movies, you know. I didn't, I didn't, you know, there wasn't, I, I didn't grow up watching uh, Bergman that came later. So, you know, my, my first movies were, you know, those 80s sort of films and, and they shaped me, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a question from Trevor. How did you pick which dances to be represented in the film? Were there reasons for this for the sorry specific region you wanted to represent, or was it more couple orientated, so male female versus male male? Um, there were probably some of those thoughts while writing the script, but mostly I wanted to have the dances that um, were known as softer before, like the Kintur in Achaduli and then became sort of appropriated by this ensemble and, and toughened and hardened, uh, where mm. this sort of more uh, fluid um, elements of the dance were removed. So that was part of my, my choice. And you know, there's actually one big dance scene that we shot that's not in the film. That's, it's the Teoluri dance and it's very explosive. It's the one when they like sort of jump in the air and everything. And it was a great scene, but we had to remove it because it it didn't push the narrative forward, unfortunately, as mm. I had intended to. Mm. Um, then this is a question from uh, Tanuj, uh, which is, how do you feel uh, that the film, do, do you think that the film has changed the LGBT narrative in Georgia? It's hard for me to say because I'm not there at the moment, but from hearsay and anecdotes that I've heard from people I know there, I think it for sure has. So based on that, I would say it has. Um, I mean, just as for me watching, you know, growing up in the 90s, you, you would start to see queer characters on TV for the first time and, and it was a sort of mirroring and a reflection. I think in, in, in Georgia, you know, obviously they have access to the internet and everything. So they've seen, you know, Western queer narratives, but for them to see themselves represented and their culture, I think it's very, I can imagine that it must be very significant. Mm. Were there, I mean, when you were making the film, were there any, any security issues while you were filming it? Uh, there were some, none, none, you know, very bad, but we had uh, bodyguards on set because there had been a few threats and things like that. And we, we filmed very, you know, we were very clandestine with everything we were doing. And we had a sort of an alternate story of, of what film we were pretending to shoot that we would mm -hmm. tell people. So, you know, we had to be sneaky. Yeah. Uh, but, but keep in mind, I mean, it is legal to be LGBTQ in Georgia. Uh, they are protected under minority law. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's just that socially and, and you know, with people, um, it's not really accepted in society. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. 
Um, we've had another question about the, the, the when you mentioned the the protests at the film's premiere, uh, with the question being, uh, assuming the actors still live there, from a personal safety point of view, are they safe and are they doing okay? Um, yeah, they're both safe and they're doing okay, and they have a lot of support in Georgia, um, and 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 they also feel safe there, which is amazing. So so I think they I think they're fine. Mm. Um, another scene I found very interesting in the film, and again, this goes back to my, uh, my well, I, I, I've seen so many queer films where horrible things happen and it didn't happen in this and it was yeah. very refreshing. It was uh, the scene where they visit the, the very brief scene after the club scene, actually, where they visit the sex workers on the outskirts mm. of, the, of mm. the town. And it's a very, mm. I really love that scene being in there. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, who those people were? Are they actors yeah. uh, and why that scene's yeah, in no. the film? No, they were actually, they're real people, and many of them were working that night. Uh, so, we, you know, it was very guerrilla filmmaking. Uh, I had gotten to know them while I was doing research. Um, so one of the first people that helped me when I came to Georgia the first time uh, was a guy called Lado Bitsadze, and he worked for one of the NGOs, and he introduced me to, to uh, these women and... Um, they, we became friends and I interviewed them. And when the time came for me to make the film, I asked them if they, you know, wanted to be in the film and, and be themselves. And it was, that scene was sort of improvised. And I think they were brilliant. I mean, they said the same lines every time. They had a great energy. And I just, you know, I think in my next film, we will see a lot more of them. They're amazing. Brilliant. What is your next film, possibly? Maybe. Uh, um... Uh, it's a film that I'm going to shoot. Um, I think 20% of it will be in Georgia, but most of it will be in Istanbul. Okay. Uh, we had a question from uh, Elena. Uh, what was it like to watch the relationship between the choreographer, the dancers, and the film narrative developing? Did she did she choreograph them on the spot with them, or did she make all of them before meeting them? So mm. yeah. Yeah, so we had two choreographers. So one was the one, the choreographer who remained anonymous in the credits, who did the Georgian folk dance choreography, and then we had Natya Chikadze who did the contemporary dance. And um, we, um, no, I mean we rehearsed a lot before, like for months before shooting. When I've, because we've we've talked before about the film, and um, obviously dance is probably the most represented. Uh, tenet of Georgian culture that you see in this film, but you've also talked about other key uh, Georgian cultural elements like the, the food and the wine and uh, the singing, um, all of which appear in this film in different ways. And um, I wanted to ask, again, a scene I really love is, is when the teenagers are all hung over and they're outside and you see these older men doing the, the polyphonic singing. Uh, how did you find those those singers, and uh, could you talk a little bit about the significance of, of sing that kind of singing in Georgian culture? Yeah, so that's the polyphonic uh, choir uh, choirs in Georgia, and it's one of the UNESCO World Heritages actually, and it's very unique to Georgia uh, the style of singing, and there are you know Georgian choirs all over the world actually where non Georgians sing these songs. Um, and uh, it was again our Georgian producer who found uh, those singers, and um, they were, you know, they're obviously very, very talented and brought a lot to this film. Uh, and I think that scene is sort of a midpoint in the film where both uh, Merab and Irakli find themselves perhaps having gone over, crossed the line, and they're unsure of how to proceed and if if you know they're going to acknowledge each other and, or how they're going to acknowledge each other after this it's sort of like a point of no return yeah and, and another casting decision i wanted to ask you about which you've touched on already was when he when he meets that guy he met on the bus who takes him to the nightclub and i think that i don't know if he's a professional actor or not but he's just so uh he's, he's so full of life and so like I, I just wanted to follow him for a bit in the film and yeah. i just who is he? How did you he cast him? He needs his own film too, I think. Yeah. <laughs> his name is uh, Matt Shelley, uh, uh, Matte, uh, and he, he 
he's just this brilliant kid that I met one night in that bar that, that we show in the film where he takes uh, um, Meta, uh, Levan's character Merab and, and yeah he is full of life and he I asked him if he wanted to be in the film he he's done some theater before um, I think he studied acting but now he works with fashion and he uh, he was like sure I'll be in your movie and he just <laughs> showed up in, in in his own clothes I was like put on something funky uh, or you know something cool and <laughs> I love that I just said funky uh, something and, and he showed up and he was just you know he was himself and he was great um, we've had actually just because we were talking about the polyphonic uh, singing scene uh, we've had a question from Belinda saying traditional Georgian food and music plays a very subtle but big role in the film the scene of the feast is wonderful what is specifically what is the uh, significance of the song that the men sing in that scene um, it's a love song uh, a song of unrequited love between a man and a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next scene is quite a quite a question. Is quite a big one. It's uh, from Ariana. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the reason behind the the Georgia versus Armenia feud that's hinted at throughout the film? Uh, I mean, it's not like a feud feud, but it's like Sweden and Norway. They're just always making fun of each other, and there's like this competitive thing, and and. Yeah, I think, you know, the grandmother's comment of like, oh, is she an Armenian? Like, oh, no. I think there, it's this, you know, historical thing of, of Armenians. I think they, like, 100 years ago or something, owned most parts of Tbilisi. And I think the Georgians resented them for it. And mm -hmm. I think that sort of lived on. It's, it's just this. But, you know, there's also a lot of love, I think, between Georgians and Armenians. Mm -hmm. um, it's like friendly banter, I would say. Uh, another another question uh, related to the use of honey by Robin. Uh, if this is from Emily saying, hi, Levin, big fan. Uh, Robin's Honey is such a brilliant song for such an iconic moment in the film. Is there any other song that you could have put in at that moment? And then says in brackets, I hope the cats are well. Oh, it's Emily Meskel. Hi, Emily. Um, so... Um, is that that's a very good question. What other song could I have put in that film? Or in that scene, rather? I don't know. Maybe something by Joni Mitchell. Um, that would be very gay. <laughs> Equally gay. Uh, and the cats are doing well. They're, mm. they're here. One is on the kitchen table here. I wish I could turn the computer around and show you, but I can't because all of these wires. <laughs> um, one, uh, have you had, did, when you were making the film or indeed after the, after the film had been uh, premiered, did you get much uh, support from any of the Georgian national ballets? Uh, no, I've never heard anything from them, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. And um, I also one other actor I wanted to ask you about was the actor who plays the the brother in the film. Um, is he has he acted in other films as well? Uh, to my knowledge, he did have done some short films before this film, and he but he's an actor. He he also he studied acting and he's acted in the theater, and I think he's uh, he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. He has a very good face. Yeah, he does. Yeah, and he looks like. Uh, you know, a typical like older brother, maybe also like an older brother in an 80s movie, don't you think? Has <laughs> that sort of like look of like mischief about yeah. him, up to no good. He <laughs> reminds me uh, of uh, Christopher, the, the character Christopher Moltisanti in The Sopranos. I, I think they look alike and they behave the same sort of, they have the same like energy. We have a um, Time for one more question, uh, which is: Are the folk dance rehearsal scenes and dialogue taken from real life experiences from specific gay folk dancers? They are very true to how folk rehearsals are run. So, was there? Was that? Yeah, that's the question. I did a lot of research in actual um, uh, folk dance groups or like the ensembles in in Georgia. So, a lot of the lines in those scenes are actually taken from. Uh, a real dialogue that I heard and that I recorded on my little camera. So I, I, I put a lot of research into it and I think that's why it feels so real. Mm. 
Well, thank you so ever so much, Levin, uh, for yeah. this interview. Yes, it was wonderful. It's been, it's been, it's, I think it's such a beautiful film. I think it's so sad. I mean, luckily, well, luckily is the wrong word, but it did get a few cinema screenings um, before yeah. uh, the the closure. And uh, I'm, it's great that it's available um, on various online platforms. Yeah, I'm so. happy that it, it's still reaching a lot of people. Thank you. And, um, thank you. Al. Thank you. And, and I think next, uh, next week's uh, Peccadillo Sofa Club will be uh, an interview with the director, Kenshi Wichman, who will be talking about her uh, web series, Mixed Messages. So that will be Thursday, 23rd of April. Uh, Kenshi will be in conversation with Helen DeWitt, uh, the curator. And uh, Mixed Messages is, a f is about a 36-year-old uh, gay woman navigating uh, the treacherous uh, world of the alternative uh, Berlin queer scene. And if you want to see uh, the series before the... Uh, Sofa Club, then it will be available to watch uh, for free from tomorrow on, uh, from 10 a.m. tomorrow on the Peccadillo uh, Facebook uh, page. So do check it out. And uh, to whet your appetite, uh, we're now going to play the trailer for Mixed Messages. So um, I hope you enjoy it. I just love to meet people and wherever there's anything about like dating or sex or play or anything like that, I just want to do all of those things. What about you? How, why are you here? Experience whatever comes to your awareness. Well, how do you know she likes me? I don't know, she kept looking at you. I just don't think I can do this whole cult of polyamory. There are all these people and they're swimming around and they're, they're looking for connections. They're just, they're just looking for real connections and they're bumping up against each other. They're just bumping up against each other. I want to be with you. When I saw her speed dating, I immediately got bad vibes. You did it? Yeah, just like... What are you doing? Picking up those bad vibes. I just want to recover my dignity So get your crazy tinder swipe hands off of me Oh, I just want a little bit Drinking me, push through it.